and a lot of people have been talking about this. So I've been researching this for the past uh, past few hours since it dropped, and um, I had a whole show laid out, right, and uh, putting together content uh, all today, pulling together content, and then I had to change uh, some of my content uh, because of uh, this breaking news story. So. Uh, the Mueller report shows Trump campaign did not conspire with uh, the Russian government, but is not. But Trump and the campaign are not exonerated. Well, Trump is not exonerated on obstruction of justice. Okay, and uh, you know you have to actually read the four-page um, letter summary of the Mueller report that the Attorney General, Attorney General William Barr. Uh, sent out, okay, and I, I read that uh, this evening. So we'll talk some about that, all right. And we have some clips, you you know, because you're going to hear a lot about this over the past few days, and uh, the congressional hearings are going to continue. The congressional investigations are going to continue as they should, all right. So we'll talk some about that, and then also uh, the lead story I was going to lead with tonight got bumped to the second story. And I did a, a hour and a half a video a broadcast early in the week dealing with how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in our schools. And there, there were some recent stories that took place in March of this year and also February of this year. Uh, dealing with one was dealing with a mock slave auction that was held at a school in the New York area. It was a mock slave auction in the fifth grade class, which caused a lot of outrage. Uh, also, you had a story of a Monopoly-like uh, slavery board game called uh, Ending Slavery. And there was a grandmother whose child, uh, who, uh, there was a grandmother whose grandchild was in this class. And this was a board game they were playing that was supposed to teach them uh, about slavery and the Underground Railroad and things like this, right? So we're going to talk some about this because when you have these slave reenactment games or slave reenactments that take place in classrooms, there are studies showing how this psychologically damages children, especially African American children. There's a 52 page study you may have heard me talk about before called Teaching Hard History American Slavery, Teaching Hard History American Slavery which is put out by the Southern, Lo Southern Poverty Law Center, okay? And this is an excellent, excellent uh, study from the experts that, number one, documents how the history of slavery is incorrectly being taught in uh, many of our schools across the country, not just schools that African-American children predominate in, but also schools that have a predominantly white student body as well, okay? So we'll talk some about that. So mock slave auction, monopoly-like slave game. American schools struggle with teaching the history of slavery. And the reason why it's so important to not just teach the correct history of slavery in this country and the origins of slavery, and this is something that I tried to explain to Reverend Al Sharpton when I called into his national radio show, Keeping It Real, that you hear Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. And he wasn't fully understanding what I was explaining to him, even though I was documenting it. <laughs> with with evidence, okay? So, because when we study the history of slavery in the 13 British colonies, starting with Jamestown, Virginia, 1607, well, the British colonies did not have slave statutes until 1641, starting with Massachusetts. It, it didn't come to Virginia until 1661. Now, it's going to evolve into what we call slavery. But those that, but that group of 20 and odd Africans who come into Jamestown, Virginia, August 20th, 1619, and people mistakenly think this is when African people first came to this land. And if you heard the interview I did with Sister Nubia Warford last Sunday, and we were breaking down um, Nubian women of antiquity, the queendoms of Cush, right? And we were dealing, talking about the African presence in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago. If you actually understand the chronology of history, you understand that even though the transatlantic slave trade did happen, African people were in this land we call the United States of America going back tens of thousands of years. But when we look at Jamestown, Virginia, August 20th, 1619, 
right? If you actually study the history, you'll find that that group of 29 Africans were captured in Angola by the Portuguese. It was 350 of them captured by the Portuguese. And around the coast of Mexico, they were hijacked by English pirates. And it was 50 of them, about 50 of them put on two English ships called the White Lion, L-I-O-N, and the Treasurer. And these two ships are going to come into Jamestown, Virginia, August 20, 1619. And those on the White Lion ship are going to be traded by the English captain for uh, food and supplies. But at this time, when they come in to Jamestown, Virginia, there's no slave codes. There's no slave status. They're actually put into an indentured servitude status. And then after about three to five years, they're released and comp compensated with land. If you read chapter 2 of Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr., he breaks down this history. But see, a lot of people don't accurately understand this history, and you have to, and America needs a history lesson before African Americans can even get reparations. So, so you see, all this is tied together because a lot of people advocating for reparations don't even understand really the history of slavery in this country and don't understand law. And, if, and, and all you have to do is look at what happened on Fox News this past week when you had a story dealing with um, how you had one uh, Fox News co-host uh, saying that America should be given credit for abolishing slavery after 150 years. Uh, Katie Pavlich, okay, U.S. did not abolish slavery first or in full, okay, slavery abolishment, okay. So um, what happens is, is that America has to have a history lesson. Otherwise, when you're pushing the, uh, uh, when you're pushing a bill or when you're pushing the concept of reparations, you're going to be met with insurmountable backlash because the proper argument is not being made and you're speaking to people who largely don't even understand their own history. This is why you got a lot of white supremacists running around with the Confederate battle flag of Northern Virginia under General Robert E. Lee's army and they call it the Confederate flag. They don't, they don't even understand the history that they claim is theirs. So you think they understand our history? No, they don't. So America has to have a history lesson. So in our second hour, we're going to be joined by Dr. Talitha uh, LaFloria. Now, Dr. Talitha LaFloria is the author of a fantastic book called Chained in Silence. Chained in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. Chained in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. Okay, now if you've heard of uh, the documentary slavery by uh, another name she was uh, her work was cited as a source for that documentary okay and she's a historian and she's going to be speaking at uh, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History coming up uh, Tuesday March 26 2019 6 p.m. to 7 30 p.m. at a General Motors theater all right and she will be speaking on when slavery is erased from plantations when slavery is erased from plantations so we're going to have her on in the second hour we'll talk some about her book chained in silence black women and convict labor in the new south and this deals with uh, a history of african-american women being sentenced to the convict leasing system and chain gangs, things like this, but this is a history that's not really talked about, okay? We'll talk some about that, and we'll talk about how the history of slavery is being erased from presidential slave plantations. And I was talking to her on the way in uh, to, to the studio, and she was saying how um, you will have a presence of them outside of the plantation, in the fields, things like this, but they were actually also living inside the mansion, and when you go inside these presidential mansions that are preserved as historical sites, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know that there were enslaved Africans that lived inside the mansion. Okay? So we'll talk to Dr. Talithia uh, LaFloria as well, who's an associate professor of African American Studies uh, at the, uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies uh, at the University of Virginia. Okay, and then also in the second hour, we'll be joined by Dr. Uh, not, not doctor, but uh, she's a hair doctor, okay, <laughs> Malika Tamu Cooper. I'm Malika Tamu Cooper. If you've been following me, you know this is my ninth year doing radio, so I've had her on my show a number of times. Uh, she is the uh, co-organizer of the um, 18th Annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo, and she organizes natural hair care expos across the country. And uh, I will, so it, this is coming up Saturday, March 
30th and Sunday, March 31st uh, in uh, Baltimore at the uh, uh, Fifth Armory, Reg Fifth Regiment Armory, I think it is. I'll be there in Baltimore once again uh, speaking at the 18th Annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo. So our listeners in the DMV area, I'll be in Baltimore Saturday, March 30th, Sunday, March 31st, uh, 2019. And visit naturalhaircareexpo.com, naturalhaircareexpo.com for more information. But we'll have her on um, in the second hour as well, okay? And we'll talk about the Natural Hair Care Expo. We'll talk about the phenomenon the, uh, of, of African-American women, more African-American women, more and more adopting natural hairstyles. We'll also talk about the backlash, the attack that we're seeing, especially on African-American girls in uh, schools wearing natural hair, being sent home because of their natural hair, being ridiculed, etc. okay? Um, and then speaking of natural hair, you remember the story of 16-year-old wrestler Andrew Johnson, right? Well, the referee who forced him uh, to cut his dreadlocks is now suing, alleging emotional distress. Now, the brother, the 16-year-old, he was clearly the victim. Hmm. But now you got the white referee flipping the script, making himself the victim. Imagine that. Okay, so we'll talk some about that as well. All right. Now, uh, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can, you can control the circumference of his actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the show. We deal with current events and history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. Uh, Sign, sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, also go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? And uh, we're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. We're also broadcasting on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation's uh, fan page also, uh, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation on Facebook, okay? So share those broadcasts as well. Uh, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. That helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, etc. It helps me get to Baltimore and get back from Baltimore as well because I got to pay my way there. Uh, usually when I travel, I have to pay my way also. So uh, that helps with all of that. Uh, or you can go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and uh, click on the yellow donate button and uh, my DVD lectures are there at our website also that helps to uh, support the African History Network as well. Okay, so um, the summary of the uh, Mueller report and the Mueller report has not been released to the public yet, okay? So we're going by what uh, Trump nominated Attorney General William Barr is telling us uh, is in the Mueller report telling us the conclusions and in his four page summary of the Mueller report there were only four sentences that were direct quotes from the Mueller report also which is very interesting as well okay so we have to keep that in mind also all right so uh, let's look at uh, let's look at this you know Washington Post had a good article about this I've been reading a few articles been watching the news coverage on MSNBC um, so Washington Post had a good article dealing with this, also NBCNews.com. Mueller finds no proof of Trump collusion with Russia. A.G. Barr says evidence not sufficient to prosecute. A.G. Barr says evidence not sufficient to prosecute. Quote, while the report does not conclude that the president committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. End quote, the special counsel said in his report. Now, this is, Mu this is what Mueller is saying in his report, right? But um, you have Barr who is going, who's drawing a conclusion from, a, from what Mueller is stating, but Mueller did not yield a conclusion from what we can tell, okay? And Trump is lying, uh, saying that he's uh, totally vindicated. No, he's not. 
and you have uh, almost 20 investigations, probably about 20 investigations that are taking place, those are not going to stop either, okay? So, if we look quickly here at the um, article from the uh, Washington Post, Mueller did not find uh, the Trump campaign conspired with Russia, Attorney General says. Now, Special Counsel Robert S. Mueller did not find that Donald Trump or his campaign schemed with Russians to interfere in the 2016 presidential election, according to a summary released uh, Sunday that the president uh, immediately embraced as a, quote, complete exoneration, end quote. No, it's not. Even though Robert S. Mueller reached no conclusion about whether the president obstructed justice. Okay, now I've read the four-page uh, summary. If you read the article from uh, the Washington Post, we'll post it on the thread of the broadcast, Mueller did not find the Trump campaign conspired with Russia, Attorney General says. There's a link in here where you can read the entire four-page summary from the Attorney General. Now, after nearly two, a, t after a nearly two-year investigation, 675 days, Mueller's findings seem to dispel the cloud of conspiracy that has hung over the administration since its inception. Uh, but by delivering caveats alongside conclusions, uh, the closing of the Mueller investigation opens the door to fierce, to fiercer political fights over the president's judgment and power. Okay, now you're still going to have to explain to me. Why were there over? Why did the Trump campaign have over 100 contacts with Russians? You still have to explain that to me, okay? Because I, I still don't have an expl explanation for that. Now, the four-page summary issued on Sunday, March 24, 2019, by a, a Trump-nominated Attorney General William P. Barr declared, "Quote: The special counsel's investigation did not find that the Trump campaign or anyone associated with it conspired or coordinated with." Russia in its efforts to influence the 2016 uh, U.S. presidential election, end quote. Now, we do know that the Russians interfered with the election, and the report documents that, okay? And then also, very quickly, we're coming up on the break, they have a caveat on page, a footnote on page two, uh, in assessing potential conspiracy charges, the special counsel also considered whether members of the Trump campaign, quote-unquote, coordinated with Russian election interference activities. The special counsel defined coordination as an, quote, agreement, tacit or expressed between the Trump campaign and the Russian government or uh, on election interference, end quote. But as Malcolm Nance said, Malcolm Nance, counter-terrorist uh, expert, uh, as he said on MSNBC this evening, he said there was open collusion. There was, we, we, we saw them colluding with the Russians openly. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. You listen to 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio, the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotep. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, March 24th, 2019, and uh, we are live. All right, so right before the break, we were talking some about the, um, the, the four-page summary of the Mueller report that uh, Trump-nominated Attorney General William Barr put out today. Now, we don't know how many pages the Mueller report is because in this four-page summary, uh, Attorney General William Barr does not say. Also, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, uh, Rosenstein helped to put together this summary. But, um, you know, it's very, very interesting here. So, um, right before the break, I was sharing, you, sharing with you the article from uh, the Washington Post entitled, Mueller did not find the Trump campaign conspired with Russia, Attorney General says. Um, so, after a nearly two-year investigation, Mueller's findings uh, seem to dispel the cloud of conspiracy that has hung over the administration since its inception. But by delivering caveats alongside conclusions, the closing of the Mueller investigation opens the door to fiercer political fights over the president's judgment and power. The four-page summary issued Sunday by Attorney General William P. Barr declared, quote, the special counsel's investigation did not find that the Trump campaign or anyone associated with it conspired or coordinated with Russia in its efforts to influence the 2016 U.S. presidential election, end quote. Now, the letter noted that uh, Mueller's probe said uh, no such conspiracy was found, quote, despite multiple offers from Russia-affiliated individuals to assist the Trump campaign, end quote. Uh, Attorney General William P. Barr said, uh, uh, Attorney General William P. Barr, sa Barr said he and Justice Department officials separately determined 
there was insufficient evidence to make an obstruction accusation against the president, though Special Counsel Mueller was not definitive on that point. So you have Representative uh, Jerry Nadler, who's the chair of the House Judiciary Committee. You have uh, others. You have uh, Representative um, uh, coin out of uh, Tennessee saying, wait a second, it's up to Congress, it's up to the House of Representatives to determine obstruction of justice. It's not up to the Attorney General to determine, the, the Trump nominated Attorney General to determine whether or not uh, there was obstruction of justice based upon Robert Mueller's uh, investigation because Mueller did not come to that conclusion. There was evidence for and against obstruction of justice. So you have many people asking, well, wait a second, how can uh, Attorney General Barr come to that conclusion? So this evening, there was uh, unprecedented coverage on MSNBC dealing with uh, the release of the four-page summary. Uh, let's go to this clip. This is uh, Chief Legal Analyst uh, Ari Melber uh, on MSNBC breaking this down. Let's go to this clip. Turn it up in here. Good evening, I'm Ari Melber, anchoring live from Washington with special coverage of the first experts we've ever seen of the Mueller report. President Trump returning to the White House this hour. He's breaking his weekend-long silence to welcome this new letter from hand-picked Attorney General William Barr characterizing Special Counsel Bob Mueller's report and asserting the President did not obstruct justice. Now here are the facts. First, the Mueller probe did end without indictments for election conspiracy or collusion. And Barr's letter today, which we're going to get into, this is the biggest news not only of the night but potentially of the year, it notes that. Second, this Mueller report did not did not exonerate President Trump of obstruction of open, and that's according to the best presentation of the evidence on behalf of Donald Trump by his own Attorney General Barr. And this is what you need to know tonight. Barr's letter today, tonight, tries to go much farther than what Mueller found on obstruction. And you're going to hear a lot about this tonight in the coming days. It tries to declare that Donald Trump, who appointed Barr flatly as a conclusion, did not obstruct justice. Now, with that factual context in mind, let me give you exactly what we have. These are Barr's highlights. Insufficient evidence to establish collusion. No conclusion about if Trump obstructed justice, according to Mueller. Barr quotes Mueller as stating that the Mueller probe did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in election interference activities, and the evidence does not establish that the president was involved in an underlying crime related to Russian election interference, a.k.a. collusion. Then we read in this new letter, the report leaves unresolved, I repeat, leaves unresolved what Special Counsel Mueller views as difficult issues of law and fact concerning whether President Trump's actions and intent could be viewed as obstruction. And while the report does not conclude that the President committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. That is in this letter. That is now an open question for you, for the Congress, for anyone who understands that after 22 months, Mueller clearly looks pretty fair. A lot of smoke about Russian collusion, but no fire. And yet, while Barr could have stopped there and let you or the Congress or the country deal with this, he goes much further tonight. And this is important. I'm going to bring in my experts on it in a moment. He says that he decided that while Mueller did not try to resolve if Donald Trump obstructed justice, he is going to. Now, that's important because in past probes, whether you agree with the outcomes or not, you may remember, in both the Clinton and Nixon cases, these kind of findings about potential obstruction are referred to the Congress for its judgment. But Barr's not referring this to Congress. Instead, tonight, he's doing something very different that I would observe might become quite controversial. Barr stating his own view tonight that he thinks his boss, Donald Trump, did not obstruct justice. And, of course, the president would be seizing on that to declare no collusion, no obstruction. And after a very unusually silent weekend, he broke his silence just now. It was just announced there was no collusion with Russia, the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. There was no collusion with Russia. There was no obstruction and none whatsoever. And it was a complete and total exoneration. It's a shame that your president has had to go through this for before I even got elected. It began. And it began illegally. And hopefully somebody's going to look at the other side. This was an illegal takedown that failed. I want to 
to be very clear with you tonight because this really matters. You heard three key things from the president one there. Minute. One of them is uh, true. Two minute. of them are false. I'll leave it to others to describe whether those false things look like unintentional falsehoods or lies, but they are false. What is true is that according to the information we have, the lack of indictments at the end of this probe and the excerpts from the DOJ, Mueller did not find a collusion conspiracy. That is a true thing the president just said, and like anyone caught up in a probe, it's understandable that he wants to bang that drum. Then the president said a false thing. He said that this probe results in him being cleared of obstruction. It does not. I just walked you through that. Mr. Barr, Trump's own appointee, can walk you through that, because we'll be going you through and quoting his own letter. And then number three, the president said something that has been characteristic throughout this probe. Even after he claims he was cleared, he is still trying to run down the people who've done this investigation, Mr. Mueller and others, and saying that their work was illegal, that they are potentially the criminals. Based on what we know and the evidence we have, that is also flatly false. Okay, so watch that at uh, MSNBC.com. They have a lot of really good coverage, factual coverage, not Trump TV coverage, right? Like, really factual coverage. That clip is from MSNBC. Mueller states no exoneration for Trump on obstruction. Trump claims opposite, okay? And that was MSNBC, MSNBC chief legal analyst Ari Melber, who, unlike Trump, is actually an attorney, actually has a law degree. Unlike Michael Cohen, uh, um, Ari Melber has not been disbarred. Like from the bar, right? Okay, so uh, check that out. Now, uh, this morning on AM Joy, Joanne Reed, she had a segment. Mueller report could be released to public eventually. Okay, so that was before uh, the summary came out. Okay, this this evening. But I want you to go watch that clip because she has a a, a good graphic in the clip called Special Counsel Investigation. Okay, so uh, so you know Trump says this is illegal. No, it wasn't illegal. Um, it's under the powers of the Department of Justice to have a special counsel. Okay, it wasn't wasn't illegal. All right, but when we look at um, convictions, right, and we look at uh, indictments, so there have been 34 people charged in this special counsel investigation. There were seven guilty pleas, one conviction by trial. Paul Manafort. Okay, that that, that Trump is the first sitting president to have his campaign chairman or campaign manager like be convicted and go to prison okay four 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 people have been jailed or incarcerated five people have been sentenced now let's look at this very quickly then we'll go to the phone lines we'll go to al call in numbers 313-778-7600 313-778-7600 so we have paul manafort convicted and pleaded guilty we have michael corn former longtime uh, attorney for donald trump who implicated donald trump in uh, committing felonies uh, in the uh, report from the Southern District of New York, uh, he, uh, 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 Trump is listed as individual number one, okay? And we also know Trump is imp implicated in committing campaign finance uh, law violations, which also is a felony, okay? Not only that, Michael Cohen turned over documentation, corroborating documentation to the House, um, to, to, to the House uh, Oversight Committee, okay, including checks that Trump signed reimbursing uh, Michael Cohen for paying $130,000 in hush money to Stormy Downs to keep her quiet about a, a, an alleged affair that she had with Donald Trump and and, and, and and this was this whole thing was conspired and these payments were about two months before the election and it was not reported in the campaign finance report that's a campaign finance law violation that's a felony so, so if you go back and look at who broke the story of Stormy Daniels for 910 AM Superstation, that was me on Cliff Russell's show. I was, I was a, a guest on Cliff Russell's show. We know Cliff is past. He's an ancestor now. We miss Cliff Russell. Right? So Cliff Russell's sitting right in this seat where I am. I'm sitting to the right of him. And we're on break, and I see a story come across my timeline on Facebook from rawstory.com talking about a porno star, adult film star. And Stormy Daniels and Hush and uh, Hush and all this. I said, Cliff, look at this, right? So when we come back from the break, I broke that story for 19 a.m. Superstation. So we have Michael Cohen pleaded guilty. Michael Flynn, former former National Security Advisor for Donald Trump, spent like 24 days on the job. Remember, Michael? Now, if you if you forgot who Michael Flynn is, right? Michael Flynn is the guy 
who was sitting next to Vladimir Putin on his right at the December 2015 10-year uh, anniversary of Russia Today TV in Russia. So you see the picture, and NBCNews.com has articles about this. When I was on the morning show uh, on, this, on this station, I talked about this. People jumped on me because I said, uh, why was Jill Stein sitting at the same table with Vladimir Putin and Attorney General Michael Flynn? And Jill Stein was running for President of the United States. So Vladimir Putin is sitting right here. To the right of him is Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, who then later became Donald Trump's national security advisor, even though President Barack Obama told Donald Trump, don't hire this guy as your national security advisor because I had to fire him. This dumbass wouldn't hire him anyway. Trump went and hired him anyway. And then sitting across from the table is Jill Stein. And I said, wait a second. I said, all this can't be a coincidence. All this can't be a coincidence. Now, if you know anything about Malcolm Nance, counterterrorist uh, expert, and uh, I, was, I may have a clip with Malcolm, I'm not sure, but go to MSNBC.com, search for Malcolm Nance. You see him from today breaking this stuff down. He's saying, you know, this stuff doesn't make sense. He said, how, he said, how do you explain all these connections with the Russians? N-A-N-C-E. See, Malcolm says that you have to do a whole lot of coordination for a coincidence to happen. He says you have to have a whole lot of coordination for a coincidence to happen. So you have Michael Flynn pleaded guilty. You had George Papadopoulos pleaded guilty, who was a, a staffer in the Trump campaign. You had Rick Gates, who was a partner of Paul Manafort. He pleaded guilty. You had Alex uh, Vanderswan. He pleaded guilty. You had Richard uh, Pinedo, who I don't, I don't even remember who he was. He pleaded guilty. Konstantin Kalimnik, Russian. He's indicted. Roger Stone, dirty trickster, who was a campaign advisor for Richard Nixon, longtime friend of Donald Trump. He's indicted. He's indicted. You had 13 Russian nationals indicted. You had 12 Russian military officers indicted as well. So you had 34 people charged, seven guilty pleas, one conviction by trial, Paul Manafort. Four jailed or incarcerated, five sentenced. Now also keep in mind, you have a number of investigations still going on into uh, Trump organizations, things like this. One, the Trump campaign. Investigations are still going on, congressional investigations. Two, Trump Foundation. Three, Trump Organization. Four, Trump Transition Team. Five, Trump Inauguration Committee. $107 million raised. All the money's not accounted for. Where did the rest of the money go, for, go to? You didn't have big name stars performing. What, 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 what happened to all the money? Six, Trump administration. So there are a number of investigations taking place as well. That are, and they're going to be more coming. They're going to be more, I'm telling you right now, they're going to be more coming as well. Okay? And then also, uh, this morning, AM Joy, and we may have time to squeeze in the clip, uh, Maxine Waters was interviewed. And she's talking about potential impeachment, impeachable offenses. Obstruct, obstructing justice, collusion, violating the Emoluments Clause, Article 1, Section 9 of the U.S. Constitution, pay for play, abuse of power, attacking the press, attacks on investigations, campaign finance law violations, corruption, promise of pardons, and influencing 2016 election. Go check out the, go check out the segment from uh, MSNBC AM Joy, March 24, 2019, entitled, Mueller report is not the end for Dems, Maxine Waters tells Joy Reid. Mueller report is not the end for Dems, Maxine Waters tells Joy Reid. You can Google that title or go to MSNBC, search for that, watch it in its entirety. Okay, create, cre create a, uh, um, cre uh, create the bookmarks right in Firefox or whatever or Google Chrome. Create the bookmarks, create the folders so you can archive. All this stuff, okay? So you have this evidence. So when people call in to these shows acting the fool, you can hit them with the evidence, okay? Let's go quickly to the phone lines. Let's go to Al, line one. Hey, Al, welcome to the African History Network show. Uh, thanks for calling. Tell us where you're calling from. What's going on, Mike? All right, what's going on, Al? I'm, I'm here to you right now. Gary Jackson has been in the Republican Party for about 
Well, well, let's look at this. He, he can bring it up, but there's going to be a whole lot of uh, evidence to show him, to show that he's lying, one. Two, keep in mind, 2016, he got 2.8 million fewer votes than Hillary Clinton. Three, we saw a blue wave in the, in the 20, uh, 2018 midterm elections, which is going to continue. And uh, most of the uh, Democrats ran on the platform of the issues, not Russia. They ran on the platform of the issues, not Russia. And, and no, no. go ahead. Some of these people like who? What are you talking about? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Yeah, I ain't got no faith in these white people. I'm just going to I'm going to Oh, okay. <laughs> and, 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 right. You talk, come on, think about this, Mike. Uh-huh. This is a guy they care about when the people that still went and voted for they thought it, you well, know what? Well, 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 here's the thing. A lot, a lot of them, a lot. Well, so let's look at this. Fifty-three uh, percent of white women voted for Trump. Forty-seven percent of white women didn't vote for Trump. Some of these white women got their tax returns and said, "What is this?" You know. So, so you, now the other thing that you, that we have to understand, right, is that you have a momentum taking place. So in 2020, you're going to have 12 million 18-year-olds voting for the first time. Fifty percent of them are going to be non-white. See, their demographic changes. Their demographic changes that are taking place that a lot of people are scared of and is not in favor of Republicans. Republicans don't have a growing party. They have a dwindling party. This is why they this is why they engage in rapid voter suppression. This is why they're trying to stack the courts. This is why they're trying to engage in uh, uh, packing in the districts, things like this, because they see the numbers are not on their side. So we have to be smarter than that. We have to be smarter than that and, 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 and deal with the policies and vote for people whose policies are in our best interest. And, and nine times out of ten is not nine times out of ten is not Republicans, and I'm not a Democrat or a Republican, but I study policies. Go ahead, and I have to get to John. I'm with you. I'm with politics. I, I don't play in any party. Right. I, I just hope and pray that people have some common sense and realize that he's not going to be. He's not. This guy's rich and his family and friends. If people don't realize that by now, mm-hmm. I mean, think about this. He also recovered that this man got a ton of money from the good state. They just talked about, I don't know if you saw Deutsche Bank. Right. Yeah, he's talking about how much money you got. See, I'm telling people, he tell you ain't a producer, but brother, who are you beholden to? Because right. A lot of your money is not from this country, so who are you beholden to? Right, exactly, exactly. And, but not only that, his, his, not only that, his hotel in Washington, D.C., that's actually owned by taxpayers, and he leases it. And you have dignitaries staying there from other countries. You had T-Mobile uh, uh, executives, things like this, staying there because T-Mobile was trying to push through a merger, uh, get, trying to get it approved by the FTC, and the Department of Justice was uh, intervening, things like this. So, th- so this is why, if you saw AM Joy this morning, and they're talking about possible reasons for impeachment, uh, violations of Article One, Section 9 of the U.S. Constitution, which is the Monument Clause, is one of them. And, and so, so, so there are a number of different things there. I'm, I'm telling you, this, this is going to continue. There are a number of different things there. Okay, Al, keep listening. I got to get to John and then get to Dwayne. Okay, all right. Uh, let's go to John uh, line two. Hey, John, welcome to the African History Network show. Uh, thanks for holding. Tell us where you're calling from. Well, thank you very much, Hotel. I'm calling from the east side of Detroit. Okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah, man. Thank you for breaking it down to so this, this guy you just got to talk to. Mm-hmm. You are always calling it don't vote, I don't vote. Well, no, no, I don't think Al, no, that's Al, that's my friend. I don't think Al, I don't, Al tells people don't vote. Yeah, that's my friend, Al. I don't think he tells people don't vote. Yeah, I'll call him a family, so tell me, I don't see why they don't, don't vote, vote, Yeah, I, I, now, John, John, in all fairness, I have never heard Al say that, and Al has been listening to me even when I was doing national radio. I have never heard Al say don't vote. You, you, you got to go pay, Jose. I, I, I accept your, your word. So it may, it may be a different Al, but this Al right here, I have never heard Al tell people don't vote. I've known Al for years. Well, well, well okay, well, we, 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 we move on from there. Okay. okay. You is exactly right. Why you can't see New York lawyers get a hold of that money and, and, and all these deals that he you know, created and all these millions and millions of dollars that's been thrown around coming from different places. I right. Mean, right. He ain't, seen, he ain't seen nothing yet. They 
<laughs> right. F- f- so follow. So John, follow the congressional hearings. Follow the congressional investigations, and, and, and then also also follow the investigations coming out of the Southern District of New York, the uh, the, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office as well. Follow, because 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 a lot of legal scholars are saying that those investigations coming out of the Southern District of New York are a bigger threat than the Mueller investigation. They've been saying this even before this report came out. They were saying this. Something, yeah, some things he handed off to uh, the Southern District of New York, right? Exactly, exactly. So I just want to say, stay tuned and watch these, what what the Mueller report is going to bring to well, well, now, 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 Maxine Waters is the is the chair of the finance committee. Uh, a few months ago on MSNBC, she said it would not be the finance committee that would get his taxes. It would be the Ways and Means committee that would get his taxes, not the finance committee. Okay, so, but, 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 but mm-hmm. right. Okay, John. Okay, keep keep listening. Okay, all right. I, I, I want to go to the second clip, and then we'll go back to the phone lines. Three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred. Three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred is the call in number. If you have a question or comment, now this is Representative Jerry Nattler. He uh, did a press conference this uh, uh, evening after the uh, William Barr four page summary of the uh, Mueller. Uh, report was released. Now, Representative Jerry Nadler is the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Remember, it's the House Judiciary Judiciary Committee that debates um, articles of impeachment, and they are the ones who actually drop the articles of impeachment, and they will vote, and, and then they, they vote within the committee. Then, if it passes the committee, then it goes to the general body of the House of Representatives to vote uh, to uh, impeach the president. If it passes the House of Representatives, and you need 218 votes to um, for, for an impeachment uh, for the uh, impeachment bill or what have you to pass the House of Representatives, then it goes to the U.S. Senate for the actual trial. So impeachment does not mean removal from office. Impeachment impeachment does not mean removal from office. Okay. Now that is one of the outcomes of impeachment. And you need 67 votes in the U.S. Senate to impeach a president. Okay, 67 votes. And Republican uh, Democrats have, I think it's 40. I think it's 46 now in the uh, in the U.S. Senate. Okay, they are they are a minority in the U.S. Senate. Okay, so you need two thirds majority vote in the U.S. Senate to impeach a president. And keep in mind, the U.S. senators are the jurors. The U.S. senators are the jurors. That's where the hearing take, takes place. So impeachment does not necessarily mean removal from office. Read Article 2, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution also. Okay, let's go to this clip, Representative Jerry Nadler. Hey, I received a four-page letter from Attorney General Barr outlining his summary of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's report while making a few questionable legal arguments of his own. I take from this letter three points. First, President Trump is wrong. This report does not amount to a so-called total exoneration. Special Counsel Mueller was clear that his report, quote, does not exonerate, close quote, the President. The Special Counsel spent 22 months uncovering evidence of obstruction and other misconduct. Attorney General Barr, who auditioned for his role with an open memorandum suggesting that the obstruction investigation was unconscionable and that a president and that it was almost impossible for any president to commit obstruction of justice since he is the head of the executive branch made a decision about that evidence in under 48 hours his conclusions raise more questions than the answer given the fact that Mueller uncovered evidence that in his own words does not exonerate the president. It is unconscionable that President Trump would try to spin the special counsel's counsel's findings as if his conduct was remotely acceptable. (coughs) Second, given these questions, it is imperative that the Attorney General release the full report and the underlying evidence. The entire unfiltered report 
as well as the evidence underlying that report must be made available to Congress and to the American people. As much information can be, as can be made public should be made public without delay. I intend to fight for that transparency. We will ask the Attorney General to testify before the House Judiciary Committee. We will demand the release of the full report. The American people are entitled to a full accounting of the President's misconduct referenced by the Special Counsel. Third, the Attorney General's comments make it clear that Congress must step in to get the truth and provide full transparency to the American people. The President has not been exonerated by the Special Counsel, yet the Attorney General has decided not to go further or apparently to share those findings with the public. We cannot simply rely on what may be a hasty, partisan interpretation of the facts. Earlier this month, the House passed a resolution calling for full and complete release of the Special Counsel's report by a vote of 420 to nothing. We now call on the Attorney General to honor that request, to release the report and the underlying evidence, and to appear before the Judiciary Committee to answer our questions without delay. That's the statement. Thank you. Take a few questions. Take a few questions. Can't hear you. Sorry. Pause it right there. Pause it. Okay. Okay. We're going to pause it there. We'll try to squeeze that in on the other side of the break because we're running out of time. Uh, but that is uh, from MSNBC. That was uh, just a few hours ago. Um, MSNBC.com. The name of that clip Nat Nadler, N A D L E R. We can't rely on what uh, we can't rely on what may be a hasty partisan interpretation of facts. Okay, that's the MSNBC.com, March 24, 2019. Watch that entire video. Let's go to the phone lines quickly. Let's go to Dwayne. Hey, Dwayne, uh, thanks for holding. Welcome to the African History Network show. Uh, tell us where you're calling from. This, hi, this is Dwayne from the northeast side. Northeast I'm side of Detroit. Okay, I'm all right, man. Go ahead. What's going on? Um, you always talk about black folks and poor folks play checkers and start, they don't play chess. This is an example of a chess game. Mm-hmm. Grandmaster level you chess. Grandma. You sit up there and line yourself with Boy Scouts, and they get they, they go to jail, and nothing happens, and, and, you, and, and you you didn't do nothing. You didn't do nothing. You the most you know, incompetent <laughs> administrator in history. Mm-hmm. And that's the only other excuse. That, that's the only other excuse. He's not guilty. He's really guilty of that. Well, 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 now, now keep in mind, see, many legal scholars said that um, uh, Robert Mueller would follow the Department of Justice guidelines that a sitting president could not be indicted, okay, because Mueller is, is a by-the-book prosecutor, all right? Now, that is not settled law, however, okay, that's not settled law. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution. Huh? We always talk about politics. Let's talk common sense. That, that politics is just a game. Mm-hmm. And that law is a game. Let's use common sense. I sit up there. I got all these. I, I sit up there constantly. I can never criticize Russia. I, I fired the man, the FBI director. Mm-hmm. I'm constantly meeting with people. Come on. That's, that's, that's why that law game, all, all that stuff is game. Games. Well, keep, let's keep in mind. Let's keep in mind. Let, let me let me ask you a question. Let me let me ask you a question, Dwayne. Did you um, did you read the four page summary from William Barr? I don't have to read the summary. Okay. So so what we have to understand is what, what we have to understand is slow slow slow, 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 slow down slow down. I'm gonna let you finish. Slow down. So what we have to understand is slow slow down. Oh, just a second. Slow down. So what we have to understand is one. The Mueller report has not been released to the public. Two, this is Attorney General William Barr, who had Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, Rosenstein help him put together this four-page summary. But we're not hearing from Special Counsel Robert Mueller about the report. When you actually when you actually read the four-page summary, and I've read it before I came on the air, there are only there are only four uh, only four direct quotes from Mueller's report and it's only like one sentence each. Okay, so this is this is the Trump nominated attorney general giving his summary of Mueller's report and he's going beyond what Mueller said when it came to obstruction of justice. You have 
you have Barr, who's basically exonerating Trump when it comes to obstruction of justice, but Robert Mueller did not exonerate him when it came to obstruction of justice. Go ahead, and then we're coming up on a break. we got about a minute okay, before the break. Like, you're, you're talking legal. Okay. See, that's the best that is a game. That's a game. Let me, let me make this point. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to investigate my boss. Mm -hmm. I never like to talk to assistants. <laughs> the assistants are going to defend the people. That's, the, that's illogical. See, that's not common sense. Congress should have just gone on and investigated totally independently in the first place. It's, it's, it's too much gains and waste of time. Well, well, that's, so... That's why I, I understand your point about... Well, well, well when, when, you say, when, when, when you say Congress should have investigated, keep in mind that for the first two years, Republicans were in control of both that's, branches that's, of Congress. That's a good point. That's excellent. And, 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 and they, they were playing... They were soft-shoeing this. Okay? So, so the reason why you have these congressional investigations launch now is because Democrats are in control of the House of Representatives. This is why you have these congressional this is why you have these congressional uh, hearings and investigations and they're going to be more coming. But also keep in mind that when they when when uh, uh, Democrats took control of the House of Representatives January third during a thirty five day government shutdown, which slowed down a lot of what they were doing also. Okay? Mike, you're making you're making a lot of excellent points. And you're talking Legally, intellectually, but I like see the problem is legally and is we need a, that's a place we need that, but there's mm -hmm. common sense and logic and and, and this game plan and wasting time. See, we, time, we don't have time. We don't know how much time we got. Too much time is wasted. It's a, that's that's what I, my I, I hate to say it, uh, it's, uh, talk with frustration. Okay. But to me, it's just too many games. Life is too short. That's, I, I just see too many political, economic gains. That's mm -hmm. why it, it, well, it, well, this isn't, Dwayne, and I got to go to break because I got a guest coming up at the top of the hour, but this is an example of how elections have consequences. That's true. This that's is true. an example of how elections have This is why I told people during 2016, because the president nominates not just Supreme Court justices, not just federal court justices, but it, this, the, the president also nominates the attorney general. The so attorney, the, and, and if you go to, and people, if you go to DOJ.gov, no, justice.gov. Justice.gov is the official website of the Department of Justice. Look at look at the Department of Justice hierarchy chart, and look at all of the uh, legal departments and entities and agencies that report to the Attorney General. Okay, Dwayne, we're up against a break. I I got I got to run, man. Thanks thanks for calling. Keep listening. Okay, you listen to 19 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio, Michael M. Hotel. When we come back, we'll be joined by Malika Tamu Cooper. We'll talk about the Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo. We'll also be joined by Dr. Uh, Talitha LaFloria, and we'll deal with uh, black women uh, on, in, in the convict leasing system, and we'll talk about uh, erasing slavery on the plantations. 19 a.m. Superstation, Future Radio, Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, March 24th, 2019. We are in our second hour. That first hour went by very, very quickly. We were talking oh, yeah. about uh, Mueller report shows Trump campaign did not conspire with Russian government, but is not exonerated on obstruction of justice, even though Trump is lying, saying that it, it did exonerate him. No, that's not what it said. Uh, but what did you expect from a person who's told over 9,000 false and misleading statements? Um, in, in uh, during their administration, okay. So I I, I see now I'm going to have to do a broadcast like Monday or Tuesday, a Facebook Live broadcast to go deeper into this uh, information because I didn't have enough time in the first hour. Uh, follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M Hotel I M H O T E P. Michael M Hotel I M H O T E P. I did a broadcast um, on what was that March 20th, Wednesday I think it was March 20th, uh, dealing with. Uh, American schools can't figure out how to teach uh, children slavery uh, with recent instances of mock slave auctions and a monopoly-like role-playing game. I did an hour and a half of broadcast and it's on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network as well. All right, so on the line, we're joined by uh, Malika Tamu Cooper, who is the, um, uh, number one, she is a uh, natural hair doctor, if you, if you could say that. And uh, also, uh, she is the co-organizer of the 18th annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo taking place at the 5th Regiment Armory, uh, Saturday, March 30th, Sunday, March 31st. Uh, how you doing tonight, Malika? I'm well. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. It's good to uh, always talk to you. You know, it's that time of the year again, uh, so it's time for me to be back in Baltimore for two days coming up Saturday, March 30th, Sunday, March 31st. So we know that 
Um, you know, you put on, you and your group put on some fantastic natural hair care expos in different cities across the country. Mm -hmm. And I think probably Baltimore is probably the largest or at least one of the largest, if it's, if it's not the largest. So um, let people know what can they expect at this expo and why is uh, why is there a need for a natural hair care expo also? Well, hair is just one part of it. I use hair as a catalyst to pull us all together, especially the sisters, because the one thing we have in common is the fact that we like to keep our hair really, 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 really nice mm -hmm. and healthy. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, once I get you all into an arena, when I get you there, I can't just tell you about hair. That would be very shallow. I want to get you there. I want to educate you on the, your holistic living, right. um, holistic eating. Uh, I want to educate you on everything from finances to budgeting to um, I have a, a clinical psychologist there mm. uh, teaching women to be the, the – doing a, a, a um, class on uh, how to be the content woman. I also have a class this year on colorism. You know, I have a sister, a girl who – her name is Tula Love. She'll be there. Okay. And she'll be teaching about <clears> – <throat> excuse me – the fact that uh, her mother is white and her father is black. Mm -hmm. And the class is called colorism, and it's about – how her father never wanted her to do anything that was culturally black. Mm. Her father even married a white man, and when uh, she wanted to learn how to braid her hair because her hair didn't turn out to be. Maleka, you said her father. Right. You said her father married a her white man. Father, her, I mean a white woman. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, I'm just checking. And, okay. Uh, <laughs> she, okay, I will change that. I will, let me clear. Her father married a white woman. Okay hoping that his, that his children would turn out to be white. Okay. But his children did turn out to be very fair-skinned, but with absolutely um, kinky hair. Okay. So he, he what the, all of the effects of him having a problem with the fact that he was a black man, um, you know, how it affected his children. So there's a class on colorism. Okay. Uh, the, so once we get you there, it's not just about hair. Of course, right. we have classes on hair. Mm -hmm. We have and we have you coming teaching yes. about the the great um, uh, great black women American in history. Women. Mm -hmm. the mothers of yeah. civilization, and then I'm I'm going to do great okay. black women in history, and I'm going to do the role of black women in the film Black Panther, also all in the same workshop. It, mm -hmm. Exactly. Now you understand why it's just not about hair. Right. Hair is just what we use to get you together, to make you get in here, and, and I don't want you to leave the same way you came. Right. I want you to be educated and well-rounded. And so there is a need for this, for the Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo, mm -hmm. um, to be here because this is the kind of stuff they refuse to teach you in in school, especially now that Trump is in office. <laughs> you, know, they, they, you will never get this kind of education from anybody else, and it is our responsibility to educate ourselves. Right, exactly. Okay, so this is taking place Saturday, March 30th, Sunday, March 31st at the uh, 5th, uh, 5th uh, Armory Regiment. 5th Regiment Armory. 5th Regiment uh -huh. Armory, yes, in uh, Baltimore. Go ahead and give them the information. Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the best thing for you to do, and uh, I want to also let people know, is that we uh, let you know that we have plenty of vending space left. Okay. But um, the best thing for you to do is to go online to www.natural.com haircareexpo.com, naturalhaircareexpo.com. It is the 18th annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo, March 30th and 31st from 11 to 7 both days. It's $20 admission to get in, and $20 is really nominal for the amount of education, the 125 vendors, the 36 classes. Um, this year's special guest is Kimberly Elise. I don't know if you remember oh. her from Set It Off, from yeah. Diary of a Mad Black Woman. Well, she has a new line of natural hair care products that she's putting out. She has a do-it-yourself um, home remedies that she's putting out there, and she's given a, a lecture. We also have uh, Michael McMillan. He is the one of the second largest um Facebook pages on it's called the Beard Game Matters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, brothers are now wearing their facial hair; they're letting it grow out. And I call, I say to everybody now, the beard is the new six pack. 
<laughs> brothers, are, br- brothers are wearing their beards and sisters are loving them. But the, the fact that men were never taught to groom their beards with, um, you know, soften and condition it, brush it, make it look uh, ni- nice and neat and presentable. So uh, with that being said, we have the brother Mike McMillan from The Beard Game Matters, and mm-hmm. I invite you to join his Facebook page. Now, what's the name, of the, what's the name of the Facebook page? The Beard Game Matters. Okay, The Beard Game, G-A-M-E, Matters. Uh-huh, okay, Matters. On Facebook. Yes. Okay, go ahead. And then my, my final guest, who I am so, so excited to have, uh, because there are a lot of brothers here, who are out here who are barbers, mm-hmm. who are entrepreneurs, and you can only cut so many heads in a day. And so they always reach a ceiling with their money because it's just physically impossible to make millions just being your barber. Right. So Morano Hodge, you can look him up at uh, at Morano M R I mean, M O R O N O one mm-hmm. on Twitter. He and he is coming and he is teaching you how to be a millionaire, how to make a hundred thousand dollars just being a barber with how to do skin treatments and, and therm- clearing up of the, the pimples and the ingrown hairs and wow. things like that. So he's really, really good. And then my final class is a sister. Her, 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 she's a millionaire. Her company is called Diva by Cindy. She's teaching you, those sisters who have their own small um, products and things, she's showing you how to get them in Amazon. She's showing you how to get them in Target. She's showing you how to get it in Walmart. She's trying to show you how to take your retail game to another level. So this is just not about hair. This is about business. This is about finance. We have business coaches there. We have clinical psychologists because there are a lot of sisters in, in out here right now who don't have somebody to talk to mm-hmm. who may need serious um, mental help, and they don't know where to go or who to trust. We, you know, that mental illness, it, it runs rampant in our communities, and it's just going untreated. And we need to have somebody to talk to. So we have a clinical psychologist for that. We have so much going on at the Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo. Our, our, our um, next step after this will be Salisbury, Maryland. Then we're going to be going to Cleveland, Ohio. Then we'll be going to uh, uh, Kearney, New Jersey. Right, Cleveland, uh, in yeah. Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. Cle- Cle- Cleveland, Kearney, New Jersey, Pittsburgh, Edmonton, Canada, Gastonia, North Carolina. This is a traveling show. Right. This is an educational piece. This is much needed in the African American community. Now, now uh, give people the website www.naturalcarecareexpo.com, or you can call my salon, Dresden mm-hmm. Head. Mm-hmm. At four one zero two nine eight zero six six zero. Okay, for, give them give them the number again. Four one zero two nine eight zero six six zero. Okay, and then you do this across the country, and then I should probably be in Cleveland also because Cleveland is only a two and a half hour drive from Detroit. All right, so I should, so I should, and remember, you came to our Cleveland show yes. before. Yep, and we blew the whole hotel out. <laughs> there were no more. No, I mean, there was we people couldn't even get around. We had so many people right. at it's that just, uh, that expo. It's steadily growing. We had, we had to have you bend in the hallway. Yeah, you, you did. You did. Yep. Yeah. Yep, you did. Yes. So, so it, was, it was just an explosion. Right, absolutely. So I, I'll be there uh, again this year. I'll be a vendor both days so people come visit my vendor mm-hmm. booth. It's only one day, May 5th, in Cleveland. No, no, no. I'm talking about Baltimore. I'm talking about Baltimore. Okay. I'll be Baltimore, there both, yeah. yeah, I'll be there both days. People come visit visit my vendor booth, and, uh, and uh, I'll be doing my workshop both days. So I'll have the, we'll, the, the information will be on naturalhaircareexpo.com about the workshops and the yeah. schedules, and I'll have it on my website, africanhistorynetwork.com as well. So let me ask you this question because we have a few more minutes here left in the interview. Um, so recently, mm-hmm. and even last year, but, you know, in the, especially like the last couple of years, we hear these disturbing stories about African-American girls in school who are being chastised for wearing their natural hair. They may be suspended, sent home, mm-hmm. ridiculed. Um, how how do you and the uh, people who have these workshops, right, these, these very informative workshops, how do we deal with all of that? 
Well, well, at our show, we're going to have a class called the logistics of natural hair care. Okay. We have to start changing the the narrative. We have to shift the paradigm. We have to do something to combat this uh, that's going on. And sadly enough, it's always it's also by our own people doing yes. it to our yes. to us too. Mm-hmm. But that's true. You know, we got to change the the negative connotations to, to, for the word nappy. Yeah. I love the word nappy. Yes, my hair is nappy. Yes, it's the most perfect coil pattern ever. Mm-hmm. We have to start educating our sisters on the fact that there's no such thing as good hair or bad hair. All right. hair that's clean and healthy is good hair. Mm-hmm. Okay? You know, there are four types of hair. It's either kinky, curly, wavy, or straight. Okay. So hair doesn't know a color. It's either kinky, curly, wavy, or straight. But we give kinky hair a bad name. But kinky hair is really the most delicate hair. It's the most softest hair. It is hair and not what we would consider fur. You know, so there there are some things we have to just begin to change the narrative. We have to start teaching our children right now that their hair is beautiful in its natural state. Right. We have to start we have to start also going into the school systems and having them have sensitivity training. Yes, you know, absolutely. Everybody is everybody is not going to look. You want diversity, you want diversity in your your uh, lifestyle. Meaning, you want us to adopt the uh, the the theory of homosexuality. Mm-hmm. You want us to adopt everything else. Mm-hmm. You want us to adopt the fact that interracial marriages. You want us to do all those things, but you're not meeting us halfway on the hair thing. Right. Right. And the hair thing is, uh, of course, I'm, I may want to cover it. I may want to wear it out. I may want to wear it in an afro. Mm-hmm. I may want to wear it first. I may want to wear it with braids. But you're going to stop me from doing a job or being on TV, from all kinds of things, because I want to wear my hair in its natural state. So now what's, what kind of uh, psyche is that that... I've never seen my hair stop me from typing, filing, speaking correctly, <laughs> none of those things. Right. But you have a problem. And, and I understand in America that image is everything. Mm-hmm. I understand that. Right. But, you know, I, I don't look like you. You don't look like me. So why are you chastising me for not looking like you? So let me you ask you this. what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. Uh, this is, let me ask you this question because we have about four minutes left here. Um when you in the various workshops that are going to be taking place uh, Saturday March 30th Sunday March 31st uh, 2019 at the 18th annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo um are there workshops also that show uh African American women how to wear different natural hairstyles in 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 their professional career so the reason why I say that is because even though certain hairstyles may be acceptable to us, we also have to face reality. Some women, some of our sisters work in corporate America, and they want to wear natural exactly. hairstyles, right? And they don't want to get fired. Okay, so do you, do you, do you have so this is go ahead. I, This is what I tell them. I mm-hmm. say, pull out your employee handbook. Okay. The employee handbook will say, because they always have a chapter on grooming. Okay. The employee handbook will say, neat, well-groomed, no fattish colors, not touching the collar, mm-hmm. you know, those type of things. So if you do your hair and you choose to make it crimson red, then you're, 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 you, you know you're going to have problems. Right, okay. okay? <laughs> right. Uh, you know, that's understood. You right. know you're going to have problems. If you've got one side purple and, you're, and, the other, and then you're going to put on a business suit. Now, how crazy is that? Right, okay. So you understand, we understand that it images everything. Mm-hmm. So at this show, we're having a 60 woman, 60 females, and 12 males, natural hair show, runway show. Runway show, okay. Runway show. Wow. So, of course, you know, 60 diverse women, different DNA from all over the place, Mm -hmm. are going to be there. I don't care if you are size 32 or size zero. Mm -hmm. We're having a real woman show and a real male show. Showing how you can wear your hair in its natural state, not a whole bunch of fattish colors. Right. We'll have some women in business suits. We'll have some women in nightclubs. 
Uh, After five attire. After five attire. Right. After five. Exactly. Right. So, and, and, and we have them all shapes, sizes, and colors. And the beautiful thing is we will be parading. I call it the parade of textures. Mm-hmm. We, we even have a, a white girl coming because her hair is bone straight. Okay. You know? And what, I, I, what we're doing is we're showing the diversity and the professionalism as well as the creativity of our hair. Absolutely. And, and the other great thing about it is that you're going to have a lot of African-American vendors there that have all different types mm-hmm. of products hair products, natural hair products, uh, and even products that are not juices. for your yeah, juices, even the, the, the cultural enrichment. You have a lot of cultural mm-hmm. enrichment products. But even uh, even for African-American men who don't have a beard, they can still attend this as well. Tell them why. Well, the, there are two types of tickets. Okay. We're going to be making sure that they that we have a regular general admission ticket, but if you get a VIP ticket, you get a twist out kit, a product for your natural hair, and you also get, a, for the men, they get a, a men's kit. Okay. We want to put everybody on the same page in the same book. And mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you why. In the cosmetology books, there are no standards for natural hair. Mm-hmm. They want everybody to get put sodium lauryl sulfate or sodium hydroxide in their hair, uh, manipulate the curl pattern to make everybody look exactly the same. You will not find a track weave or glue in this show. Wow. And we, we, they want everybody to to kind of emulate a, a Eurocentric standard of beauty. Exactly. And that's not what we are. Exactly. We're here to dispel those myths. We're here to change the game. Mm-hmm. You know, this has turned into, you know, the, 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 all of those other companies, Revlon and all of those other companies, right. are missing money. You know why? Why? Because this generation of millennials are now going back to the natural absolutely okay and now and they're mixing products in their own house yes so this is what you need to this is why you need to attend because we've taken the money out of their pockets and put it back into our own community uh, so once again and we're out of time here once again visit natural hair care expo.com natural hair care expo.com for more information and to purchase tickets for the 18th annual baltimore natural hair care expo taking place saturday march 30th sunday march 31st 11 a.m to 7 p.m both days at the fifth regiment armory the fifth regiment armory located at 219 29th division street baltimore maryland i'll be there both days visit my vendor table i have my dvd lectures there i'll be doing workshops both days also and uh this week uh sometime i know the uh the workshops will be on the website we'll also have the information on my website africanhistorynetwork.com all right uh maleka well it's good talking to you and i will see you, you this too. weekend okay all right thank all right. you all bye right. bye take care no uh, no problem take care all right uh everybody and those in the dmv area hey if you want me to do a presentation for a group organization while i'm in town email me at customer service at african history network.com customer service at african history network.com you listen to 9 10 a.m superstation and future radio michael and hotel will be back with dr uh talitha talitha uh la floria talking about chained and silenced black women and convict labor in the new south 9 10 a.m superstation and future radio we'll be back in a few minutes Welcome back to 910 AM Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, March 24th, 2019. Uh, we just uh, finished talking to uh, Malika Tamu Cooper about the 18th annual uh, Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo. So I'll be there uh, Saturday, March 30th, Sunday, March 31st. Uh, 2019 so those in the DMV area look out for me there okay so in the first hour you know we talked about um, the Attorney General William Barr releasing his four page summary of the uh, Mueller report we have not uh, the Mueller report has not been released to the public yet uh, it should be released so we can actually read it for ourselves uh, Mueller report shows Trump campaign did not conspire with Russian government but he is not exonerated on obstruction of justice and I'll let you hear from uh, Representative Nadler Jerry Nadler who's the chair of the House Judiciary Committee now this morning on uh, AM Joy, Joanne Reed's show on MSNBC, uh, she interviewed uh, the chair of the Finance Committee, Representative Maxine Waters. And uh, this was before the uh, four-page summary from William Barr was released. 
but the Mueller report has not been released yet, okay? Um, so let's go to this clip here. Do you believe Donald Trump should be impeached? Well, I, I think that they will come. I think that they will come. I don't think he's a legitimate. I, I, I said it back at the end of, uh, of the election, and uh, I still believe that today. That he is not a legitimate president? He is not a legitimate president. As the country waits to see what Attorney General William Barr may reveal today uh, about the contents of the Mueller report, congressional Democrats are keeping the pressure on. The chairs of six House committees, including my next guest, have issued a statement demanding that Barr make Mueller's report public immediately. And joining me now for your moment of Maxine, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, chair of the Financial Services Committee of the House of Representatives. Thank you for being here, Congresswoman. You're so welcome. Delighted to be here always. Thank you very much. Let's start with what um, William Barr, the current Attorney General, has said uh, in his letter on Friday. He said, I remain committed to as much transparency as possible, and I will keep you informed as to the status of my review. That was his letter to Congress. Is that enough? Not now? good enough. We want full disclosure. The American people deserve to know what our special counsel has discovered uh, in this investigation over 22 months. We don't want to hear anything about uh, Barr using his discretion uh, to decide what we should see, what we should know and not know. We want the full report. We deserve it, and we're going to keep the pressure on uh, to say to him, we want transparency. We want to know exactly what's in that report. And we want all of the underlying documents to go along with it. And if uh, Mr. Barr, Attorney General, Barr does not release the full report to Congress. Do you believe that the report and or Mr. Barr should be subpoenaed? Oh, I absolutely do believe that. Uh, we have to come to that decision. The five of us uh, who are chairing committees uh, that have oversight responsibility and we're all involved cooperating with each other really would like to have full disclosure. We want the real report. However, I certainly agree, and I think they will too, that if he does not release it, that it should be subpoenaed. And you have uh, Donald Trump supporters, including his former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, out there tweeting and saying, essentially presuming that the president has been exonerated by the report, and uh, in Nikki Haley's case, uh, saying that it's been completed and everyone should just move on. It's, it's, it's a curious position to take since we don't know what's in the report, um, but do you see colleagues on the other side of the aisle sort of declaring this whole thing at an end uh, and wanting no further inquiry. I know that the House has something like 80 subpoenas still out. Absolutely. Well, I want to tell you that this president has a way of trying to get into people's heads and indoctrinate them. He's been saying no collusion, no collusion, no collusion over and over again for a long time now. And he's going to try and conclude uh, that there, this report is proving that there's no collusion. And you have a lot of his sycophants who will, you know, take the nod from him and they'll say the same thing. Uh, but we cannot allow them to get away with this. He does this all the time. This this is not the end of anything. This is the, well, it's the end of the report and the investigation by Mueller. But those of us who chair these committees have a responsibility to continue with our oversight because there's so much uh, that needs to be, uh, you know, taken a look at at this point. And so it's it's not the end of everything. Yeah. And there are a lot of folks on the other side of the aisle, Republicans, who believe that we're Democrats in Congress, yourself included, just want this report as a pretext to impeach Donald Trump. You have said for quite some time you think he should be impeached. What would you say to those who say you guys want this report so that you can just use it as a pretext for impeachment? Well, uh, you know, I've said over and over again that this president has defined himself uh, and he has committed, uh, you know, not only obstruction of justice right before our very eyes, uh, but he has said and done things that could lead you to the conclusion that there has been uh, collusion, uh, uh, lead us to the point where we understand that there has been collusion. And so let's just put up a few of the uh, potential impeachable offenses that, you know, you and we have discussed on this show, um, you've discussed them on this show uh, often. Um, there is the potential of obstruction of justice, something that was not, we don't know if that's 
Democrats in the Mueller report at all, things like collusion with a foreign power, with Russia, abuse of power, pay for play, tax and investigation, etc. There's a whole long list of these things uh, that are concerning to a majority of the American people. Among those things, what if, if one of those or it would to, were to be in the Mueller report that to you would be the most um, would, would cause you to believe the most that there should be an impeachment immediately of this president, what would it be? What would be the one thing that you think he's done well, that's impeachable? Well, you know, I think there are some very specific things, like Manafort given to Kalimnik uh, polling data. Why would he be giving polling data uh, from the election uh, to this Russian? Uh, why would he be, uh, you know, literally... Um, uh, talking about, well, first of all, we have all of these contacts that we have, have been documented uh, with those members of the uh, the group of people who are around this president having met with or talked with Russians, and they lie about it. Why would they do that? I think when you take a look at the lies, the meetings, uh, the, um, the big meeting that took place at Trump Towers, uh, when you take a look at the polling data that has been given uh, to Russians, when you take a look at the fact that Flynn called someone in Russia, I think during the inauguration, and, and told him, you know, that the sanctions were going to be lifted and they could go on with their big energy project. There's so much that's there that shows collusion, as far as I'm concerned, and obstruction of justice. And I believe that we're well past the time when we should have co considered <coughs> Uh, impeachment of this president. And, you know, on the other side of that argument, you have Jim Comey, who was, of course, the person fired, who he was head of the FBI. His firing and Donald Trump's admission of why he fired him uh, to our very own NBC's uh, own Lester Holt, which he said he fired him because of Russia. Comey has come out with an op-ed. It, uh, it was po published in the New York Times on Thursday, in which he said that he hopes Donald Trump is not impeached and removed from office because, in his view, a significant portion of this country would view that as a coup. Your thoughts? Well, you know, I cannot talk about not impeaching uh, this president because there are those who don't like it or who will consider it a, 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 some kind of, a, you know, way that we're saying that we didn't like the fact that he didn't get elected and that Hillary Clinton, that he got elected and Hillary Clinton did not get elected. We can't consider that. We must consider the information that's before us. We must see what's in this report and we must also understand what information is in this report that would lead us to do further investigation and further work in our committees. Congressman Maxine Waters, uh, always great to see you. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to next week, and I'm waiting for this report. Yep. This is very important, and we want the whole thing. All right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Okay. You're welcome. All right, and coming up, Republic. Okay, so that's from this morning, uh, AM Joy, Joanne Reed, MSNBC. That clip is entitled, Mueller Report is Not the End for Dems. Maxine Waters tells Joy Reed. Go watch that again. Uh, msnbc.com archive that earlier in the broadcast and we'll, we'll go to uh, Dr. LaFloria in just a minute so hold the line um, the, earlier in the, uh, in the first hour I talked about uh, Trump's team had over 100 contacts with Russian linked officials report shows that's from uh, news.yahoo.com news.yahoo.com we'll post a link on the thread of the broadcast we'll also post that on our Facebook fan page the African History Network that was picked up from USA Today that's from January 9th 2019 January 9th 2019 members of uh, Donald Trump's campaign and transition team had more than 100 contacts with Russian linked officials according to a new report the milestone illustrates the deep ties between members of Trump's circle and the Kremlin the findings tracked by the Center for American Progress and its Moscow project could uh, come amid reports that Special Counsel Robert Mueller is uh, near, nearing the conclusion of the two-year investigation into Russia collusion. Okay, so this is this is prior to the report released today by Attorney General um, William Barr. Quote: This wasn't just one email or call, or 
or one this or that, said Talia Dessel, D-E-S-S-E-L, a research analyst for the left-leaning organization. Quote, over 100 contacts is really significant because you don't just have 100 contacts with a foreign power if there's nothing going on. End quote. Also, this is a foreign adversary to the U.S. The number of contacts was raised to 101 uh, in the uh, second week of January 2019 after it was reported that Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, who's in prison, and Rick Gates, uh, who, you know, we, we talked about was, uh, uh, Rick Gates was indicted. And let's see, what's the status of Gates? Rick Gates pleaded guilty, okay? Rick Gates pleaded guilty. He was a, a partner of Paul Manafort, all right? Um, Paul Manafort and Rick Gates, a former campaign aide, uh, uh, shared polling data with Paul Manafort's former Russian business partner, Constantine. Constantine Kalimnik, and this is somebody, uh, if I remember correctly, Paul Manafort owned, uh, owed Constantine Kalimnik like millions of dollars, okay? So, uh, Talia Dessel noted the group's list of contacts is on the quote-unquote conservative end, and the quote, very minimum amount of contacts, end quote, between Russian-linked officials and those within the Trump campaign and transition. Read, the, read this in its entirety, okay? Because you see, you're going to see more um, investigations coming from uh, the House of Representatives. Trump's team had over 100 contacts with Russian-linked officials, report shows. Okay, so uh, on the line we're joined by Dr. Talitha LaFloria. Uh, she is the Lisa Smith Discovery Associate Professor in African and African American Studies at the University of Virginia and an Andrew Carnegie Fellow. She is a scholar of African American history specializing in mass incarceration, Modern Slavery and Black Women in America. She is the author of Chained in Silence, Chained in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. Uh, this book, and this, this book right here that I heard uh, Cliff Russell interview her uh, about three years ago or so. And uh, I heard the interview, so I ordered the book right away. And we all, all miss Cliff Russell. We know Cliff has passed on. He's an ancestor now. But uh, I, I first found out about her on the Cliff Russell show. Okay. So now this book received several national awards, including the Darlene Clark Hine Award uh, from the Organization of American Historians in 2016, the Philip Taft uh, Labor History Award from the Cornell University of Industrial and Labor Relations and Labor and Working Class. History Association 2016, uh, as well as some other awards also. Now, she has um, uh, also received the Ida B. Wells Tribute Award from the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, where she will be speaking on Tuesday, March 26, 2019, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., uh, speaking, talking about when slavery is erased from plantations. We want to welcome to the African History Network show Dr. Talitha LaFloria. How are you doing tonight, sister? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. All right. No problem. Thanks for coming on. Well, I'm looking forward to your uh, lecture on Tuesday, and I'm very familiar with your work, familiar with your book as well. I ordered your book. Uh, so, I mean, this is the first book I've seen of this type dealing with black women and convict labor in the New South. So, so tell us a little bit about this topic, and then we'll get into when slavery is erased from plantations. Okay, awesome. Um, sure. So, you know, as we know, oftentimes uh, mass incarceration is um, an epidemic that is um, gendered, you know, male right. and black. Exactly. Um, oftentimes, the experiences of women and their experiences of mass their experiences of mass incarceration in the contemporary and in the past are, are overlooked or ignored. Mm -hmm. So, um, about maybe twelve, thirteen years ago, while I was a PhD student, I started to do um, research on convict leasing. And it, it, what I, you know, learned through that process was that, you know, southern states were able, well, actually, southern states um, took it upon themselves to lease entire prison populations to private industrialists, right. uh, to these private contractors to work in factories and to build railroads and to build bridges and to work in brickyards and mines and um, you know, they basically worked these people to death, and it was essentially slavery by another name. But right. what I did not know was that women were also forced to work in the same system. So um, I wrote this book. I, it was born out of about 12 years of research, and what it shows is that 
black women were essentially re-enslaved through the penal system after emancipation in the southern states, particularly in the state of Georgia, where they were forced to do everything from, you know, build railroads to work in brickyards to work as lumberjacks to work as blacksmiths, gristmill operators. Right. And to also, they were oftentimes victims of sexual violence. They became pregnant in these prison camps. Their babies were oftentimes killed. Mm. And, um, you know, they were not seen as really, you know, not just, women, but they were really dehumanized. And the only right. time that their womanhood was acknowledged was when they were, you know, victims of rape. So this just, in many ways, um, shows just how this this epidemic of mass incarceration and its impact on women, you know, is a continuation of, of a system that has been with us for a long time. And its impact on men as well. You know, mass incarceration is, is uh, has a long history. And so... Absolutely. Um, this book was an attempt to expose that history from a female perspective. Absolutely. Well, in your book, you talk about uh, 1896 and Maddie Crawford. Maddie Crawford, uh, who was convicted of murder by Meriwether, uh, Meriwether County Judge and sentenced to life imprisonment in the Georgia mm -hmm. State Penitentiary. Tell us a little bit about Maddie Crawford and why she is so significant in this story. So Maddie Crawford is so significant in this story because um, in 1896, um, as you mentioned, she uh, killed her stepfather, who she said had been abusing her. Mm -hmm. And so um, she, you know, brained him with a chair is what uh, the reports say. But when she was convicted, she was sent to a brickyard and she uh, was taught the blacksmith trade. Okay. What I should mention about Crawford is that um, she used blacksmithing as a way to gain greater mobility within the prison, you know, system, and um, it allowed her to be able to, you know, to leave the site of the prison to okay. go into people, you know, um, go into the city and to work as a blacksmith. But it was because the system wanted her you know, her labor. They forced her into this role. She was beaten out of her dresses and forced to wear, you know, a suit of men's, um, I mean, excuse me, a, a suit of men's stripes and to do this work by force. Right. But in 18, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but she ended up in 1903 being profiled in the Atlanta Constitution newspaper as the only woman blacksmith in America. Now, that is not the case. There were other women in the state of Georgia who were leased to prison camps that were working as blacksmiths. But she gained national notoriety uh, through her work as a blacksmith in the prison system. So, you know, she was able to take a really awful situation and kind of, you know, use it, um, use it to her advantage. And it did gain her greater perks within the system, but she was brutalized in the process. Okay, so when we look at, um, you're talking about after emancipation, so Civil Wars, 1861, 1865, we have the ratification of the 13th Amendment, December 6, 1865, and then we have the Black Codes instituted basically, you know, right after um, chattel slavery ends. We had the Black Codes instituted. That's uh, right. And then you have uh, the sharecropping system largely in the South mm -hmm. and the convict leasing system basically 1865 to 1928. And the, the South is trying to figure out where's the labor force coming from. To, mm -hmm. to to rebuild the South, plant the crops, things like this, because 4 million enslaved Africans were just set free. So mm -hmm. you talk about in your book female sharecroppers uh, and picking cotton, things like this, mm -hmm. right, uh, in Georgia. So so talk, mm -hmm. so talk about that uh, and the significance of that. This is after slavery ends. Yeah. So after slavery ends, you know, there are two ways that these white Southerners go about rebuilding their labor force. Right. Okay. So you, they use the convict lease system, right, in the system known as debt peonage. Yes. Where sharecroppers who were not able to make their quota, right, because the sharecroppers, they repaid their debt with the crop. Right. So any seeds or any shelter, any, any tools or resources that they were provided to be able to do that labor, they had to repay through their share of the crop. Mm -hmm. Well, if the crop failed, Okay, then they were left in debt. The following year, they had to make up twice. They'd have to produce twice the crop. Now the crop failed three, you know, you have to produce three times right, the crop. Right, they're in debt. Yep. Third year. And so they stayed in a perpetual cycle of debt. Mm -hmm. And so for those individuals who would leave the land, 
and decided, you know, um, I'm never going to get out of debt and they will leave the land, they could be arrested, put in jail, and then a landowner could come and purchase their labor and make them work until they said that it's time for them, you know, to be released. So they would have to work for indiscriminate or indeterminable, you know, periods of, of time. Right. And so the way that this affected black women is that, you know, there were black women who were a part of, who worked as sharecroppers. Most black women actually were working as domestics in, in the city of Atlanta. A lot of them, you know, were, were left and went to the city and the men stayed behind and worked the land. But for those sharecropping families that stayed together in family units, the wives would oftentimes sharecrop with them. And some of those women were convicted and were um, sent to work on these debt peonage camps. And, and so, you know, this is another part of this history of, you know, the, the, of, um, you know, labor extraction that exactly. we see after emancipation and how, you know, black people, um, all the attempts to try to obstruct black people's social, political, and economic mobility. So they're using violence. They're using the criminal injustice system. They're mm-hmm. using it, which includes the debt peonage system. You know, the black codes, it's right. all about restricting black people's freedom or stripping them of their of their freedom. Absolutely. Well, look, on page uh, 25 of your book, Chained and Silenced Black Women in Convict Labor in the New South, you say, to a large extent, the debt peonage system, a type of forced labor restored uh, hegemonic uh, authority to white planters, giving them, the, right. giving them the legal power to purchase black farm labor from county courthouses. The policies mm-hmm. set forth in the Mississippi Black Code of 1865 were implemented in all the southern states, Georgia included. Every civil officer, every civil officer was granted authority to, quote, arrest and carry back to his or her legal employer any freedman, free Negro, or mulatto who shall have quit the service of his or her employer right. before the expiration of his or her term of service without good cause, end quote. It was left to the county magistrates to decide whether the, quote, alleged deserter shall be remanded to the alleged em- employer or otherwise disposed of, end quote. That's from page 25 of the book. So now your work was featured in the Sundance-nominated documentary Slavery, by another name, as well as a C-SPAN, um, I guess, documentary called Left of Black. So it's slavery by another name, this deals with debt peonage. How does your work tie into that? And then we'll let people know how they can order your book also. So, you know, actually debt peonage is one of the topics that I don't go into as much depth about um, okay. in the book. I talk a lot more about convict leasing right. and the chain gang system. Chain gang, right. And so the chain gang system, um, I will say, had an equally devastating uh, effect on black people mm-hmm. and on black women as the convict lease system and as the debt tenure system that you laid out. So, um, you know, unfortunately, I can't, you know, speak at, at, in depth about the debt penalty system and as specifically as it applies to Georgia um, because I didn't write as much about that. But right. I do want to throw in the fact that the chain gang system yes. actually affected thousands more, tens of thousands more black people than even convict leasing did. Between 1901 and 1936, there were close to 3,000 black women sent to chain gangs and tens of thousands of black men sent to chain gangs in one state alone. Which, which state was that? Georgia. In Georgia. Okay. So uh, explain to, okay, now, uh, first of all, your work was featured in the Sundance nominated documentary Slavery by Another Name. Mm -hmm. So what what aspect of your work, so this was a documentary, what aspect of your work was featured in that documentary? And then we'll go to the phone line in just a minute. Okay. I was the expert that was um, invited to, um, to participate in that documentary and to speak about the experiences of women. Chained in Silence is the first book ever written on the history of working class incarcerated black women in the post-Civil War South. Okay. So I was invited to, to speak about their experiences, and I was the only person that spoke about women's experiences in that documentary. So that just shows that we have a long way to go with yeah. um, sharing and exposing that history. Absolutely. Um, 
and and and, and also you know when they uh, a lot of times when uh, these conversations come up, people say, "What about the women?" And then people who are trying to focus on the dehumanization of African American men. Some of them, not all of them, think that you're trying to take something away from African American men That's by talking right. about the women. But you don't have to you just just elevate the conversation and include the women. It That's doesn't right. take anything That's away it. from focusing on African American men because we've both been dehumanized. And and, and, I, and I tell people in some yeah. of my lectures. You know, I explain to people, I say, we're all going through a 12-step process, recover from That's the right. side effects of white supremacy and racism. Okay? So, That's right. So we have to deal with both of them. All right, now. That's right. So We shouldn't separate the stories. If, they were, if, if it was an inclusive story, we wouldn't have to tell it in separate parts. Absolutely. Okay, tell people where they can, how can they get your book? So you can get the book online uh, through Amazon.com or through the University of North Carolina Press website, BarnesandNoble.com, and pretty much any uh, bookseller or, or, or vendor. You can order it online All right, through now, any bookseller. Okay, and in, in a minute here, because we have a few minutes left in the interview, I want, in a minute I want you to talk about uh, when slavery is erased from plantations. You'll be speaking at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History Tuesday, March 26, 2019, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. But very quickly, I want to ask you, explain to people the difference between the convict leasing system and, and the chain gang system, because a lot of people think they're the same thing. Explain the difference. Okay, that's a great question. So the convict lease system affected felons. Mm -hmm. And people who were convicted um, of quote-unquote crimes because a lot of times they were trumped up charges and people were, and a lot of innocent people went to prison and died in these prison camps. Right. But usually if you were serving a term of a year or more, you were sent to a convict lease camp. If you were a misdemeanant and you were incarcerated for a year or less, you were sent to a chain gang. If you were unable to pay your fine, um, they would send you to a chain gang. And most black people were desperate and poor during this time period, and they could not pay fines, you know, as quote-unquote low as $3. They didn't have that kind of money. Right. So so, this, so uh, what would happen is is that because of the black codes instituted in 1865, these were codes to regulate the newly freed enslaved Africans, and they would have all types of laws, vagrancy laws. And in some, southern, right. in some southern states, if you wanted to have a profession other than agriculture, you had to pay like a tax. At the beginning of each That's year, right. something like that, right? And if you couldn't pay that yeah. tax, then, you know, you, you'd be sent to the, so they would send you, what, to the chain gang or the convict leasing system, depending upon uh, the, yes. the, yep, the yes. pen, okay, and, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And if you couldn't pay, you know, if you didn't have a job. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Right there, mm -hmm. If you didn't have a job. Right. Quote, unquote, idle. Right. You were sent to the chain gang. Right. And you were fined. And, and sent to the chain gang. Because if you don't have a job, you don't have money. Exactly. So black people didn't even have the right to decide whether they wanted to work or not. You know, if right. I've been enslaved all these years, hey, I might want to take a little vacation. Right. <laughs> to to work. But they didn't have that option. They didn't have that option. And white people, and they didn't want to be under white people's rule and authority. So, mm -hmm. hey, some black folks didn't want to go straight back to work. Right. Uh, I would encourage people to uh, go to history.com, official website of the History Channel, and search for Black Codes, C-O-D-E-S. They have a good article there dealing with some of the history of the Black Codes, history.com. Uh, so it, tell us about when slavery is erased from plantations, because this is what you will, will speak on uh, Tuesday, March 26th at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Yeah, so um, I'll be speaking at the Wright Museum and talking about the importance of truth-telling okay. at historic sites and plantations, particularly presidential plantations across this country. Mm -hmm. uh, what I've found uh, by visiting plantations such as the Monticello Plantation, which I've visited about maybe four times now mm -hmm. over the past three years, um, is that oftentimes the story of slavery is told as a separate story right? and that uh, it's a segregated story. And so, you know, when you go inside of these presidential mansions, you hear about these presidents, how wonderful they were and how smart they were and how innovative that they were. And you get these, you know, you're sold these narratives of American exceptionalism. Right. But nobody talks about the enslaved population that made these men exceptional and was the basis for their wealth mm -hmm. and built their plantations, right? Right. And so they... um what I found is that you have to leave out of the mansion before you get any 
interpretation of slavery. You know, slavery is, is an option. You know, you opt in. You take optional slavery tours. It's not an, a natural extension of the of the um, narrative that you're, you know, that you're told within the household. Enslaved people are not even talked about inside of these households. Right. So what I want to talk about at the Wright Museum is how, you know, slavery is told, the story of slavery is told as a separate story, and how in some places, like, for example, you know, um, some of these Confederate museums, the story of slavery is not told at all. It's completely as erased. It's as if, you know, our ancestors did absolutely nothing, you know, to um, to to build uh, the South, the plantation, the slaveocracy, and the wealth, you know, these plantation holders um, extracted it. from our bodies and from black women's wombs that were used to produce more labor. Exactly. So mm-hmm. these are the things that I plan to discuss. And, and you, you talked about you visit uh, the Monticello uh, estate or plantation. That was Thomas Jefferson's plantation. And uh, you and I had a conversation. You were saying how... When you go, you have to. Uh, when you go inside the actual mansion, there's no uh, uh, presence or evidence of enslaved Africans living inside the mansion, but they did. Uh, so, and but this, they did. Yeah. And, 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 and same Sally thing. Sally is nowhere to be found inside of that mansion, and she gave birth to six, at least six of the man's children. Right. Right. The story so, is told from the basement of the house, and so when they talk about, you know. How many children did Thomas Jefferson have? They'll say he had two children. <laughs> but downstairs, you know, when you get to Sally Hemings and Shaq, or then a uh, cabin, then he had six more. Right, so right. Well, why can't you just say that the man had at least six, you know, kids? He had at least eight children. At least, at least eight children. Had, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Right. The man that all, why, why not talk about all of his children? Because he had six with his first wife. He had six, with, at least six with Sally Hemmings. Mm, okay. And the children died, and so right. he had a total of four living children with Sally Hemmings and two living children with uh, his first with his wife uh, Martha. Right. Why doesn't he? But in that house, he had two. Right. What is that about? So, so there's an attempt to there's an attempt to try to sanitize the history, right? <laughs> there's an yeah. attempt, and, and, and this also the reason why it's and important for. Between him and slavery, create the distance. Had a six hundred slaves. How are you going to distance him Exa- from slavery? Exactly, and and the reason why this history is so important is because when we talk about reparations, and then you say have people saying, "Oh well, you know, I don't own any slaves. My ancestors didn't own any slaves." Well, wait a second. That it was enslaved Africans who built this country. There were at least Thank two. You. There were at least two hundred and sixty-two skills, trades, and crafts that African Thank people you. had in this country from 1619 to 1865 that built this country. Okay, so uh, once again, uh, you can visit uh, the website, uh, let's see, uncpress.unc.edu uh, to order her book, Change and Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. And uh, I, I think that... Or Amazon. Oh, or Amazon.com. Would they have the book at the Charles H. Wright Museum? Uh, when you speak there, do you know? I believe so. Okay. So uh, you'll be there uh, Tuesday, March 26, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Uh, I'll be there as well, so I'll get a chance to meet you. Uh, give people your, oh, great. If, if somebody wants to bring you in to do a lecture, we're out of time here. If somebody wants to bring you in to do a lecture, how do they get in contact with you? Um, you can get in contact with me through my email address at tll4y mm-hmm. at Virginia. Dot edu. All right. T-L-L-4-Y at Virginia.edu. All right, sister, you have a great night. I'll see you Tuesday, okay? Thank you. You too. All right. Okay, guys, we got to get out of here. 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. Uh, right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. Uh, Michael M. Hotel, the African History Network Show. Stay tuned for Pastor Mo. We'll talk to you next week. Peace.